choir, I would like to chapter 14 is where we're going to turn tonight. And while you're turning there, I'd like to once again take, uh, take the time to thank the pastor for allowing me to do this. It's what I'm called to do, and I'm so thankful that uh, there are preachers around this country who are willing to step out of, their, out of their pulpits for a few minutes to let men who are called to preach, I guess practice would be a, a good way to put it, because we're going to need practice before God puts us in front of a congregation to lead. So I'm so thankful that people like Pastor Burkholder and various other pastors throughout the country as I've gotten to travel have given me the opportunity to preach. Um, Proverbs chapter 14, like I said, is where we're going to go. We're just going to read one verse, uh, verse number 4. The Bible says, Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Amen. Uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to preach, the opportunity to get up here and proclaim your word. Lord, I pray that you'd make my words clear. Lord, give me clarity of thought, clarity of mind as I preach tonight, Lord, that this message would be a message from you, not from my own heart, Lord, but from you. Lord, we thank you for all you've done in our lives, everything you will do as we continue to yield our lives to you. Lord, we pray that you'd allow us to get something, Lord, that we'd leave here encouraged, or we leave here changed from this, from this message, Lord. I thank you for all you've done. And you're not pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if you're like me, the first time you read this verse was probably the first time you noticed it was in the Bible might be right at this very moment when it was read a few well, I guess a few moments ago when I read it. And uh, I know like I've read through my Bible on multiple occasions. I've read through the book of Proverbs plenty of times, but for some reason, this verse never stuck out to me. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I was, um, I was in school. It was October. It was, uh, we had a preacher's meeting there at the school where all the alumni come back and they preach, and a man preached on this passage, that all of a sudden this verse popped out to me, and it made sense. And I sat there when he first read it, and I thought, is that all he's going to read? You know, okay, okay. I wonder where he's going with this. And uh, by the end of it, it became a verse that I have recited over and over and over again in my life that's helped me. It helped me get through grad school. It's helped me through a lot of things. And I think one of the reasons why we don't quite understand the verse at first, I know I didn't, is because in order to understand a proverb, you've got to understand who the proverb was written to. In different, different cultures have different sayings, they have different ways of speaking that we wouldn't quite understand. I had a friend in school who, his name was Sebastian, he was French. One day, we, were, we drove shuttle together, and one day we're sitting in the shuttle van, and he says, that man sits upon noodles. And I was like, what? I looked at him like he was crazy. I'm like, what are you, what are you talking about? He sits upon noodles. I'm like, what, what in the world is that supposed to mean? He goes, he's, he's wealthy. He has lots of money because he's, he sits upon noodles. And I was like, 
That's, that's not an expression we use. In, you sit upon noodles, you're not wealthy here in America. Uh, but apparently in France the way it works is, well at least where, where, the, where the phrase comes from, if you're wealthy, wheat would make you wealthy. And they make noodles from wheat. Therefore if a man sits upon noodles, he has lots of wheat, therefore he's healthy, or he's wealthy. And I was like, okay, I guess it kind of makes sense. You know, it was one of the things that, you know, he got it, it made sense to him, but it didn't make any sense to me. Well, I remember one time in particular, we were sitting, me and Sebastian had a lot of these conversations. <laughs> Where he would say something, I'd look at him like, huh? And then he'd explain it to me, or vice versa. We were, we were sitting around just shooting the breeze. We, were, we, were, we mentioned uh, somebody, and the person showed up. Sebastian says, huh, while talking to the devil. I was like, while talking to the devil? You mean speak of the devil? He's like, yeah, yeah. And so we see different people try to use, you know, different... It, it, it means different things to different people depending on where you're from. And in order to understand a proverb, you have to understand where, where these people are coming from. Solomon was the king of Israel around 1000 BC or so. Between 950 and 913 is when he reigned, is what they would say. And he wrote to an agrarian society. He wrote to a, a group of people who depended greatly upon the ox for their everyday needs. He, uh, you know, in our, in our, here in our society, we can just run up to the, you know, run up to the store if we want to buy something. If we want to buy bread, we just run up to the store and buy bread. We don't have to grow grain. We don't have to plow fields. We don't have to, I mean, there are people who choose to live in a grain society. We need farmers so we can have grain. But I, would, I, I dare say that most of us here today do not have oxen. We don't have to rely upon animals. And even today, we use tractors. Who needs an ox when you can have a tractor? You know, they're far more reliable from what, you know, we would believe. But in this day and time, they relied heavily upon the ox. And so, the people who Solomon wrote this to would have instantly understood, okay, where, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. But much in increases by the strength of the ox. They'd realize how important an ox was to their lives. But they'd also realize something that, even though oxen are important, there's one thing that most people don't want to deal with about oxen. Oxen kind of stink. There are, there are lots of responsibilities that come with taking care of farm animals, such as oxen. And so the first part of this, of this proverb says, where no oxen are, the crib is clean. That makes perfect sense. Where no oxen are, there's no mess to clean up. But they would, like I said, they would realize that where no oxen are, not only is the crib clean, but the table's clean. Where no, if, if you don't, where no oxen are, there's no increase. Therefore, much increase is by the strength of the ox. They realized the ox was the ox was their daily plow. We use tractors today. They would use the ox back then. They, they they would use them to grind meal. They would use oxen for. I mean, there there are plenty of benefits to having an ox. Oxen live longer than horses. Apparently, they live. Well, me. Let me explain this for a second. Me being from the suburbs. Have, I have no dealings with oxen in my entire life, except for maybe at the zoo. And those were probably not oxen, they were probably cows. But nonetheless, <laughs> in order to understand this proverb, I had to get on the internet and look up some facts about oxen. And I find that oxen live longer than horses, therefore making them more desirable in this time period. They live up to 30 years, apparently. That's a long time for an ox, for an animal. Not only do oxen live up to 30 years, a yoke of oxen, that would be two oxen, tied together, working together as a team, can pull twice their weight. So a 4,000 pound team of oxen, yoke of oxen, can pull 8,000 pounds. That's a lot more than any man can pull. So we see that oxen were, would have been considered a great blessing to have in that day. If you had oxen, you were doing good. And you could, you, could, you could do a lot more if you had oxen than if you didn't. Not only are oxen, do they live longer, not only can they pull more than man, but when they die, you can eat them. If you ask me, that's a blessing. It's like having a tractor that makes hamburgers. That's pretty cool. I mean, uh, so the question is asked, why wouldn't you want oxen? You know, I mean, what Jewish family wouldn't want an ox? Why wouldn't they want this tractor that makes hamburgers? You know, I mean, why, why not? And I realize when it comes down to trying to figure out whether or not you want something, a lot of times you'll ask other people about it. You know, I mean, there's always those people that, I know when I, when I decided that um, I was going to get an iPad, I had those people that said, oh man, the iPad is the greatest thing ever. You have to get an iPad. It's made my life so much easier. And then I had the other people that were saying, dude, you don't want an iPad. 
there's so many restrictions, you can't do anything with an iPad. You want to get Android. And you know, we fought back and forth, you know, the different people have differing opinions on things. And so you'd always think, you're going to have the people, like if I was to ask somebody, what do you think about, what do you think about me owning a yoke of oxen? What if I decided that I wanted to buy oxen to use on my small farm, if I had a small farm? I, I, of course, I would probably get on the internet and start asking people, you know, looking at forums and threads. And so I did that. I got on the internet, I started looking around, and there were people... I found one thread in particular. This one guy decided, you know, I'm, I've got a 15 acre farm. I can't afford a tractor, so I want to buy a yoke of oxen. I want to buy a team of oxen. I want to train them. I want to use them for my daily work. And of course, you've got, you know, the people that go on down the line, oh man, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. I've used oxen for years. Then you got the guy that says, what do you need oxen for? We got tractors. I mean, why, why would you want, you know, they're going to die. A tractor, you know, you can fix that, you know. And you have the, you have the naysayers, you got the people who would look at all the benefits. You either look at all the benefits of something or you look at all the, the bad stuff about it. The, the pros and the cons would be how we'd weigh it out. And so Solomon writes here, he says, you know, much increases by the strength of the ox, but where there are no oxen, the crib is clean. And as a, a Jewish family, I would think, hmm, let me see. Do I want, hmm, do I want a stinky animal that makes a mess that I have to feed, that I have to take care of, and much increase? Do, is the increase really worth the, all the other stuff? Am I really going to increase that much if I'm doing all this? And um, you'd realize that, yes, you're going to increase more if you take the responsibility to feed, to take care of, to train those oxen to do work for you. And so Solomon writes this, this proverb to put forth two choices. He says you can, either, you can either take the responsibility and take care of these oxen, and you can have much increase, or you can take the ease route out, sell the oxen, don't have to worry about cleaning up the mess, but you're not going to increase like you thought you would. Now, if, <laughs> To a, Jew, to, a, to a society, to, to the Jews, this would it'd be a no-brainer. Of course, we're going to have oxen. Why would we not have oxen? So, you think, oh, that's, what does that have to do with me? Oxen were, like I said, a great blessing. It, would, it was a great blessing to have an oxen. To have oxen, to have an ox. That would be the singular of oxen. It would be a great blessing to have an ox, to be able to use it and to increase. But, only if you're willing to take the responsibility to take care of that oxen, will you get the blessings from having oxen? There are certain responsibilities in life that come along with the blessings of life. As, as, God, as God blesses us with things in our life, not only, we, we may be blessed with them, but there's a responsibility that accompanies those blessings. One example, it's a big example that we, I think most of us have a grip on it, but some people don't. Children. As parents, the Bible says that children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Children are a gift from God. But, as many of you would attest, and as my mom would attest, there are certain responsibilities that come with having children. There are certain responsibilities that, that sometimes aren't very fun. Discipline, and very I've never had children, so I couldn't list them all to you. But there, there are various responsibilities that come with having children. You have the choice. You can either choose to raise them as God wants them raised, take responsibility for what's been given to you, and see the blessings to come. Or you can shirk the responsibility and never see those blessings come. That goes to... It, that. That can play out in any kind of relationship in life. Friends. Friendship. There are certain responsibilities that come with being friends. The, the, there, are, there are rules to friendship. Rule number one, don't spit in your friend's face. Rule number one, do, don't do that. You're going to lose a friendship. You can, either, you can either take responsibility and do those things that friends do. For a, friend, for a man to have friends, he must show himself friendful. Friendful. Friend, friendly. A man that has... Yeah what the Bible says. Yeah, a man that has friends must show himself friendly, is what the Bible says. There are certain responsibilities that come with any kind of relationship in life. There are certain responsibilities that come with maintaining a good testimony at work. So, you want to maintain a good testimony at work. The blessings are immeasurable, but it's going to be hard work. 
It's not easy to maintain a testimony at work. Sometimes even when you work with Christian people, I work with Christian people, I've worked with Christian people for the past five years. I've worked on campus at the college and sometimes it's not easy to, to keep that testimony at work. And so I can either choose to be responsible and to work hard at keeping that testimony or I can lose it. Just like that and lose, miss out on all the blessings that come with having a good testimony at work. It takes years to build a good testimony, but only moments to destroy it. Amen. One word, one look, one action, that's all it takes to destroy a good testimony at work. Same thing at school. I remember in high school, my junior year, I got the Christian Character Award. <laughs> and then my senior year, I remember basketball. Sometimes it doesn't... A little, a little game can cause you to lose your testimony at school. Even... It, yeah, it takes, like I said, it takes years to build, a, to build a reputation, to build a good testimony, but only moments to destroy it. And you have to be, be willing to be responsible, to take the time to look after it and make sure that you can keep that good testimony at school, that good testimony at work. In school, I had the privilege for the past six and a half years to be trained under men of God who have years of experience years of experience and the blessings that come that will come because they were they poured their lives into me for the past six and a half years are immeasurable but I've been blessed beyond all reason just having the opportunity to be there and to learn under these men and sometimes it wasn't the funnest thing to do sometimes you didn't want to be sitting there at 1225 when you're supposed to get out of class at 1220 and you got to be at work at 1230 Sometimes that wasn't the funnest thing to do. And a lot of times, I just wanted, there, there were times, honestly, where either because I just wasn't right with God, where I needed to be, or I was just really stressed out with my life that I didn't even want to finish school. Times when I just wanted to quit. And I could have, you know, I just given up, not taken the responsibility that I've been given, selling the ox, to say and walked away and there's no telling where I would be today. There's no telling if I'd even have any idea what I was doing. No, would I have even opened a Bible again? I don't know. Sometimes the greatest thing, the, the, the biggest blessings that God gives us come with great, great, great responsibilities. Amen. And the question is, are you going to be willing to take the responsibility to, to, to really keep under yourself and to stay where God wants you to be in order to experience those blessings in the future. Like I said, at, at school, like, honestly, this, this passage is what kept me going through grad school. I had finished with a four-year degree. I decided, you know what? You know, if I, there's, I, there, I've done what I said I was going to come here to do. And it came down to May of 2011. I graduated and I thought, nah, I don't want to go back to school. <laughs> I, I don't want to go back to school. But I knew it was what I was supposed to do. And so the question is, am I going to buckle down and do what I'm supposed to do? Am I going to pass my class? Am I going to apply myself to my work? Or am I just going to walk away? Am I going to sell the ox and miss out on all the blessings to come? We could go on and on and on and on and on and apply this in hundreds of ways, very pointed ways to each of our individual lives. Because the, the, the principle is the same throughout all ages. Don't you don't want to forfeit a full table for a clean crib. You don't want to give up a full table. You want to give up the blessings that God has given you because they're too, it's too hard for you. Because you don't want to take the responsibility to finish and, and, and do what God's called you to do. The pastor has, has been given the blessing of pastoring this church. But with pastoring a church comes great responsibility. Though I've never pastored a church, I've had the opportunity to sit down and talk to a lot of pastors over my years, having traveled for the school. I've been in 200 and some odd churches and had the opportunity to speak with men of God who have poured, just poured their heart out to me. And I realized that pastoring is no joke. Pastoring is not a game. Pastoring is not always fun. But it's what the pastor is called to do. It, it's one, it's, and pastor knows that there are great blessings that come from pastoring. But only if he's willing to take the responsibility to do what God's called him to do. To do the, the things that aren't fun. Life's not always going to be fun. The responsibility, like, responsibility isn't fun. I'll tell you that much. I don't like having responsibilities. There's a responsibility that comes along with driving. 
stay under the speed limit. Don't run into other people. I, I like the one of don't run into other people, but the speed limit sometimes, you know, kind of bothers me. But it's a responsibility that I'm going to have to take if I'm going to keep driving. There are responsibilities that come with owning a car. Responsibilities such as put gas in the car, change the oil, pay car insurance. Those are things that are not fun, but I need a car. For the first time in my life, well, for the first time since I've been driving, I am without a vehicle. And I don't like it one bit. I, I can't imagine how anybody would ever think, you know what? I don't want a car. I don't need a car. I don't want a car. I'm not driving. I'll find some other way to get around. That's the same thing as saying, you know what? I don't need an ox. You know? I live in a great society, but I don't need an ox. I own a farm, but I don't need a tractor. I'll do this all by myself. I don't feel like taking the responsibility to, to keep changing tires on this tractor. I'm just going to throw it away and do this all myself. So often we do that with the blessings that God has given us. Whether it be a car, whether it be a relationship, whether it be school. Though I know that school sometimes doesn't seem like it's a blessing to us. It is. And you're going to benefit greatly if you'll apply yourself and if you'll finish what you've started. Even in high school, you think math isn't going to benefit you? Math will benefit you, I promise. I've used it on more than one occasion. Maybe it's because I'm a nerd. But I, I'm always using math that I learned in high school and forgot, so I've got to look it up on the internet. Thank God for the internet. There are so many things that I should, if had I been faithful to apply myself and to take care of the unfun things, the dirty, the dirty stuff in high school, I would be so much better off today. This, the same thing can be said about just about any, any aspect of life. If you're willing to apply yourself, if you're willing to keep going, even, even through the tough times, God will bless you. The, the biggest... I think the biggest responsibility we have in life would be that of living a holy, separated life unto God. And the Bible says, God says, be holy as I am holy. Throughout scripture we're commanded to live a holy, separated life. And I think we can all testify that sometimes that's not fun. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's difficult. Sometimes the rest of the world doesn't understand why we want to live a wholly separated life. But it's essential. Amen. Much like the ox was essential to agrarian society, a holy life is essential to the Christian life, to the Christian walk. It, 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 through, throughout Scripture... It's said over and over and over again, the difference between living a holy life and living a wicked life. Even on this very page in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Evil pursueth sinners, but to the righteous good shall be repaid. 14, verse 11, The house of the wicked shall be overthrown, but the tabernacle of the upright shall flourish. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. 1434, Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Amen. God has called each and every one of us to live a holy, sanctified, sep separated life unto him. And he's promised us blessing, blessings beyond all measure. But it comes with responsibilities. It's hard. It's not always fun, but it's what God's called you to do. And if, you, if you're willing to live a separate and holy life, he will bless you beyond measure. Much like, like I said, the ox was essential to an agrarian society, holiness is essential to the Christian walk. Amen. Like I said, we can go on and on. The illustrations, the comparisons don't stop there, but we could go on and on applying this passage to all aspects of our lives. Each and every one of us could mention something specifically where, you know what, this is a blessing from God, and I'm getting, I've got so caught up in the hard stuff, not wanting to do the everyday rigmarole, whatever that word is, <laughs> and that I can't see the blessings on the other side. I, I, can, I can understand a stable boy working with oxen, I've never worked with, but I can understand being being a stable boy working there. Why, why do I have to clean up after this stinky animal? 
Why do I have to deal with this day after day after day? And I get so fed up with that that I decide, you know what, I'm just going to sell the ox. Or you know what, I'm going to kill this thing and I'm going to eat it. And not look at the future, at the blessings that will come if he keeps that ox around. If he keeps taking care of the little things, taking care of the, the, the dirty work, is what I, uh, the only thing I can think of, just you know, cleaning up after him and, and feeding him and everything. Like I said, we could, we could go on and on and on and on just making comparisons and applying this specifically to our lives. The, the, the key to understanding this passage is to not get focused on the things you don't want to do. Not, get, not focus on the responsibilities and how hard this work is. But if you'll keep your eye on the blessings and the benefits Amen. of the future... The blessings and the benefits that will come from this menial work, this, this dirty work that you have to do, you can keep on. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you faint not. If you're looking towards the harvest, all this stuff means nothing. You'll be happy to do the dirty work, happy to do the small things if you're looking forward to what that increase will be. That's why for, that's, that's the only reason why we have the Bible in the English language. Because men and women, thousands of men and women, knew, they saw that, that having the Bible in the language of the people was essential. Amen. They, they, they foresaw the fact that we would be sitting here today reading the Bible in our own language if they'd keep with it. And thousands of men and women died. They were burned at the stake. They were torn asunder. They died terrible deaths so that we could have the Bible in the English language. Martyrs. You ever, if you've ever read Fox's Book of Martyrs, I would encourage you to. Just, just, even just thumb through the table of index. Thousands of people who, who, were, who, were, who were killed trying to make sure that we would have God's Word in the English language. They weren't looking at how difficult their times were. They weren't looking at the fact that, oh, I could die for this. But they were looking at the fact that they said, you know what, we... I should be willing to die for this. Because anything worth having is worth sacrificing for. Anything worth having is worth working towards with all my heart. And I encourage you to, if, if you'll stop looking at just the problems you have and the, the small, you know, the toil and the small work and look towards what God can do in the future, look towards the blessings that you'll get from doing what God's called you to do, you'll be happy to do the small work. Because you don't want to forfeit a full table for a clean crib. You don't, want to th you don't want to get wrapped up in the mindset of, oh, you know what? I could get out of all this and just go on living my life because you can't. It's essential. When God blesses you and gives you responsibilities, it's essential that you fulfill those responsibilities if you want to be blessed and if you want to increase. Because where, where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Don't forfeit a full table for a clean crib. Be willing to take responsibility with what God's given you if you want to see increase in the future. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray that I've been clear in my, my sermon, Lord, that you've... I pray, I pray that... Uh, Lord, we've understood it and that we've listened and Lord, I know that you applied it to my life and it's touched me and Lord, I pray that I was able to get that across to the people. I pray that you be with us tonight. Lord, as we leave here, that you give us safety. Lord, we thank you for all you've done. Lord, for everything you will do in our lives. In your name I pray. Amen. 118 in the book as we stand. If you'd like to sing along.